we have um, so this is our last time the next time we meet uh, is for the test it's cumulative and a lot of people stress about it the only thing that's really stressful is the fact that it's not droppable unlike all the other ones this one's not droppable. It's 15% of your grade, but when you do the math, pretty much all of the tests end up being about 15% of your grade. So it's nothing real special. It's a normal test. It's just covering everything. And the thing is, we've got 12 chapters. It's 100 questions, so that means it's about 8 to 10 questions per chapter. I can't get really in-depth on things, so, you know, it's all of the really important main ideas from each chapter not every chapter is equal I mean chapter 11 I, mean, I could have 400 questions from that one chapter so there's going to be some that as I'm going over this I'll talk about like um, the integumentary system uh, chapter 6 and chapter 5 and uh, even the the joint uh, chapter 8 um, you know, those will be on the low end of the questions because I, you know, I'm, I'm going to need more than eight to 10 questions from chapter 11, but I can't get a whole lot more. So when you're studying, this shouldn't be like you're studying for this. This shouldn't be like you're trying to learn it. This should be where you are, um, you're kind of brushing up on the material. Does that make sense? I mean, if you're, if you're just trying to learn some of this stuff, you got a problem uh, already. So, you know, when you're looking at this, don't try to dig too deep into anything. Um, that's the hardest part because, again, it's going to be easy questions. It's just coming from a bigger pool of information. Are you following me? Does that make sense? So when you're looking over this, try to remember, look, you know, Take your time, think about the stuff that the, the ideas that I, I highlighted on this, um, but don't spend way too much time on any one thing. Just try to keep it going. Don't, and again, it's really just about trying to refresh your memory of the stuff we've gone over. When I make the test, um, it's not going to be, generally, it's not going to be the questions that you had on other tests verbatim. But I'm a stats guy. I go through, I, you know, I take, you know, the bottom 10% of the questions from each test, the ones that got missed the most, and I don't include them. I take the top five that everybody got right, and I don't include them either. I want it to be where you've got to think about it a little bit, but I want it to be where it's stuff you should have seen anyway. You know, I, I don't want it to be any question that comes out of left field like you're like, no, I didn't even see that. At least I know there might be some questions on the test that on a test that we've had that you thought, man, I don't I don't remember this. But it, you know, I it's I don't want to say it. That's pretty rare, but I don't want to go through it definitely on the final and have any of those, if that makes sense. Right. So to start with, chapter one was kind of you know, a generic chapter about, you know, communication. A lot of that was uh, crossover with lab. But really, if you're looking at this, there were a couple of really important things that come up over and over again. Metabolism, right? Metabolism, you know, the sum of all the chemical processes in the body. The first couple of chapters end up talking about metabolism a pretty good bit. So, you know, when you're thinking about metabolism, understand that's chemistry. That is talking about how our body is breaking things down and putting things back together. All right? Breaking down, um, we called that, as, as far as a name, we called it catabolism. Building things up, we called it anabolism. Now, that came up a couple different times as we went through. Um, homeostasis. Pretty much everything you're going to study in the background is going to have an idea of how that system helps to keep you stable. You know, what it does 
and how it works and how it works if things go offline a little bit. So homeostasis is this balancing act our body does. And remember that it is controlled by feedback mechanisms. You have two types, positive and negative. By far, negative is the main feedback mechanism of the body. And it simply means that it is changing the course of the direction of change. That's why it's called negative. So if I have uh, my temperature is elevating, negative feedback means I'm going to lower it. If my temperature is lowering, negative feedback means I'm going to raise it. If my calcium levels raise, negative feedback means I'm lowering it. It is how our body responds to bring us back to normal. The other thing on here that I would say is going to be included is um, the membranes. And I'm including it because we, you've studied it about five different times this semester. You should know the three areas, uh, the heart, the lungs, and the abdominal pelvic viscera, and the two membranes on each one, visceral pleura vis or parietal pleura, visceral pericardium, uh, parietal pericardium, visceral peritoneum, parietal peritoneum. You should know those. Okay. Now, this isn't going to be a big part. You know, this isn't going to be a chapter that's going to have a ton of questions on it. Um, it's, I consider it one of the, the chapters that would be about average. The chemical chapter, unfortunately, which I know everybody just hates or seems like everybody hates the, the chemistry chapter, this is one of the more important chapters. This really is foundational. It really is important to understand how our body functions chemistry-wise because of the fact that's physiology. And we've taken a class called Anatomy and Physiology. Now, going back to Chapter 1, that's the very first one. You know, remember, anatomy is the study of structure. Physiology is the study of function. So on the chemical basis of it, you know, we're looking at um, how things are put together, and it starts with atoms. I'm hoping you remember atoms make up everything. I use my little corny jo joke, you know, don't trust an atom because it makes up everything. Um, but, you know, you do need to understand the basics of it because that's how things function. Right? So atoms at their core are going to have three parts to them, right, at the base of it. You've got protons, electrons, and neutrons. Protons and neutrons are found in the thing called the nucleus, the middle part, electrons, swirl around in shells. Now again, if I've got eight, you know, let's say I use ten questions on this chapter, I don't have time to get into all the, you know, what's the atomic number and whatever, but I'm hoping you kind of know those. Electrons are how atoms interact with other atoms. If an atom gains or loses an electron, remember that they have shells, and the shells want to be full. Two in the first, eight in the second, eight in the third, and that's basically where we stop. And so those outermost electrons, the electrons in the outermost shell, are called valence electron. Valence refers to the outermost shell. If an atom gains or loses an electron, it is then called an ion. Now, understand that as science goes through, as you're going through the different... Um, Chapters, even in this semester, ions are called electrolytes. They're called minerals. So they've got other names, but basically it's a charged atom. If two charged atoms form a bond, it is called an ionic bond. There's no sharing. It is just the magnetic attraction between the two. The other type of bond we talked about were where they shared things, and they were called covalent bonds. If you remember, valence is an outermost electron. If I tell you it's a covalent bond, it's telling you it's sharing the outermost electron. If it shares it evenly, it is referred to as a nonpolar covalent bond. Now, again, I'm not going to test you on this, but if you remember this, it will help that all nonpolar covalent bonds are what we refer to as a category called lipid-soluble substances. If they share unevenly, we form poles, a positive and negative pole. So those are called polar covalent bonds. 
as a category, polar covalent bonds are water soluble. That is why water and oil don't mix. One is lipid soluble, one is water soluble. One is polarized, one is non-polarized. Going back to ions, an ionic bond, because water is a polar covalent bond, when I dissolve things in water, if they are charged, they will be pulled apart. That's why they're water soluble. So if I, dropped, if I drop a compound that is an ionic bonded compound, water will pull it apart. In science, they call it dissociate. Again, that's not going to be something I'm going to test you on, but that's what happens. If one of the ions is a hydrogen ion, then it makes that substance an acid. If, on the other hand, one of the substances is what I refer to as a hydroxyl, the OH, it is a base. If neither one of those are the, two ion, are the two ions that are present, that means it's simply salt. If you're paying attention, the two things that are made special, the hydrogen and hydroxyl, if you put them together, that makes water. Everything is about water. So when we look at those, we can measure the pH scale. And the pH scale is going to concentrate totally on hydrogen. Okay. So the pH scale is from 0 to 14. And this is going to come up over and over and over again in 211. <clears throat> 0 to 7 is acidic. 7 to 14 is basic. In our body, in physiology terms, Things that are basic are referred to as alkaline. Seven is neutral. The point seven, that right at that middle, that is neutral. That's like a seesaw. If I have just as many hydrogens as I have hydroxyl, I have water. So basically, the whole pH scale is talking about the ratio of the two parts of water. I have heavy on hydrogen, it's acidic. If I have heavy on hydroxyl, it's basic or alkaline. Remember, our body is alkaline. Physiological pH, which is a fancy way of saying the pH of the body, is 7.4. There is a little range, 7.35 to 7.45, which has 7.4 in the middle, is the range of our body. If we get closer to 7.35, which means we're closer to the acidic side, we can go into what's called acidosis. It, all that simply means is we've become more acidic. If our body gets up towards the 7.45, we can end up going into what we call alkalosis, which just is a fancy way of saying we've become more alkaline. So our body's trying to fight that all the time. Again, when you get into 211, you're going to study two big systems that try to work to keep that balance, the respiratory system and the urinary system. And that's a big part of both of those chapters. Now, the last part on this ends up talking about organic molecules. This, again, is a very important thing to bring with you farther along. There are four organic molecules. Carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. You need to know the building blocks of those. Man, I wish I didn't see this in front of me. You ever see those pictures where they say if you get the right light angle, you know, the difference between a bad angle of light on a picture and a good one? Uh, this is like the worst. So... need to know the building blocks. Carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, the building blocks are monosaccharides. And you definitely need to know there is one major monosaccharide. It is called glucose. Pretty much all life revolves around that molecule. Proteins, the building blocks are called amino acids. It would be helpful later on to remember that the Bonds between the amino acids in a protein are called peptide bonds. Because when you 
you get in the digestive chapter, you're going to find there's a bunch of enzymes in there, usually called pept something. And all it's saying is that's a chemical targeting the peptide bonds. Lipids, <coughs> the main dietary lipid excuse me, <coughs> is triglycerides. And it's important to know that the triglycerides, there are three fatty acids. And the fatty acids are going to be in one of two types of camps, saturated or unsaturated. Saturated means that there's a hydrogen at every level. Saturated fatty acids, in general, are going to be found in animal fats. And they are solid at room temperature. Unsaturated fatty acids, on the other hand, are going to be liquid. They are plant fats. They are corn oil and vegetable oil. Yummy olive oil. Now again, you know, as much as people don't like this chapter, this has a ton of information that if you know it now, will help you as you go farther along. And it definitely, if you're going into um, if you're going into nursing, you're going to get into pharmacology, which is really going to be chemistry driven. So you know, got to got to kind of get past the I don't like that. Chapter three is cells. Now uh, in this chapter, um, there are some pretty important things, but basically this chapter I would say I would probably take fewer questions from. You know, I'm hoping that you know most of the things about cells, but remember we have what we call a composite cell. That's what they use to study with. A composite cell is when we take all of the parts of every cell possible and put it into one so we can look at it. Normal ideas of cells are going to have three parts to it. A cell membrane, a nucleus, and cytoplasm. First, remember cytoplasm is not the name for the liquid. Cytosol is the name for the liquid in inside of the cell. Cytoplasm is the cytosol plus the organelles. Now, there were two, well, we studied several organelles, but there are two of them that are super important. And again, we've studied them in their processes in different parts of this semester. Ribosomes, which are the site of protein synthesis, and mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. Those I would definitely know a little about. Now, ribosomes, in the next chapter, we talk about protein synthesis and how DNA is the store of the recipes to make it. And we have messenger RNA that goes in and makes a copy of a gene. And, then it's gonna, and we call that, making a copy, we call it uh, transcription. Again, if you're writing things down, you are transcribing what I'm saying. That's what messenger RNA does. It's going to leave and go out and find a ribosome. And on the ribosome, we're going to have what we call translation. Translation is simply taking it from an unusable language, the language of the messenger RNA, and that transfer RNA is going to read it and go pick the amino acids and put them into place and make it useful. That's what translation is. If I give you a, if I said, all right, I'm going to give you a copy of the final, and but I'm going to write it in Russian or whatever, um, most people here probably don't speak Russian, so you're going to have to translate it before it can help you. So that's all translation is saying. It's taking it from something we can't use as a protein and turning it into a protein. So ribosome, saying that it's the site of protein synthesis, more correctly you should say it is the site of um, translation. Does that make sense? Now there are other, um, you know, other organelles that are important. Uh, Golgi apparatus is making the little vesicles that's going to package things and send them off. Um, you know, you got rough endoplasmic reticulum and smooth endoplasmic reticulum. But the, the, the big two, ribosomes and mitochondria, are the ones I would definitely make sure you know a little about. Now, the mitochondria is all about making ATP. All right, so if you're looking at it, the next chapter, chapter four, gets into this. We call it cellular respiration. Just to go over that, remember cellular respiration happens in two phases. It's three steps, but two phases. The first step and the first phase are together. They happen when glucose enters the cell. We call it glycolysis, the splitting of glucose. And the phase is referred to as anaerobic, which means without oxygen. 
when glucose enters the cell, it's going to divide. It's going to be broken down no matter if oxygen is present or not. That's why it's called anaerobic. If oxygen is present, it is going to take the breakdown of glucose and through chemical reactions, change it in a way that can be taken into the mitochondria. There we go through the uh, citric acid or Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. Those two together are referred to as aerobic respiration because it needs oxygen. So aerobic respiration, those two steps happen in the mitochondria. Now those two steps, in particular the electron transport chain, is going to produce a ton of ATP, exponentially more than what glycolysis does. So aerobic respiration produces a lot of ATP, and that is why we call the mitochondria the powerhouse of the cell. So, you know, you might see it on a commercial. I saw some stupid commercial where the, you know, like, oh, that's the powerhouse of the cell. Like that was like some key to giant mystery. But the reason is because it produces so much ATP. The nucleus, again, is going to contain the DNA, and the DNA is your genetic information. Um, the entire strand of genetic information is called the genome. Each individual uh, section that, respond, that is um, uh, related to an individual protein is called a gene. Um, and then we talked a little bit about mitosis. Uh, mitosis is how cells reproduce. Um, we do not in here talk about meiosis, which is about reproductive cells. In here, it's just the average cell. Mitosis has four phases. If we include normal cell life called interphase, you can remember a, a little mnemonic, I pass my anatomy test. It is prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. And again, you know, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it. I don't have a, or as far as the test goes, I don't have that many questions available to get you know, too crazy with any of this. Cellular metabolism, you know, this chapter we've already talked a little bit about anabolism and catabolism, building up and breaking down um, the reactions in cellular respiration. Uh, the last thing on here is the protein synthesis, and we kind of talked about that. Messenger RNA is going to be found inside the the nucleus copying down or transcribing the information. It's going to go out to the ribosome. There the transfer RNA is going to translate it and turn it into a protein. Chapter 5, when we get into the tissues, there are four categories of tissues in the body. Right? We have epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. This chapter I will solely concentrate, like we did in regular lecture, on epithelial and connective tissue. Muscular tissue and nervous tissue have their own chapters. So epithelial tissue covers things. It has a free surface. It lines or covers things. Now, Remember, in here, this is going to be where I, you know, I'm not going to have a ton of questions on this chapter, but most of them will be kind of what we talked about with lab, right? Um, you should be able to name a type of epithelial tissue if I describe it. One cell layer thick means simple. Multiple cell layers thick is transition, or transition, uh, stratify. Sorry, erase that. Um, the... Uh, the other word is generally a description of what the cell looks like. It's either squamous, flat, cuboidal, cube-like, columnar, column-like. So if I say, all right, I need to, you know, tell me what the name of one cell layer thick of flattened cells is, you should know it is simple squamous. Now, the other thing is you need to know the location of them, the, the general idea of what we said. Uh, like we used in lab. So simple squamous is the lungs. Simple cuboidal are the kidney tubules. Simple columnar is the digestive tract. The simple columnar has a cousin that doesn't necessarily look like it called the pseudostratified columnar epithelium, which is found in the respiratory tract. 
you can kind of remember, I didn't bring this up when we were studying it, but pneumo, everybody know pneumo means air. Like if you've got an air hammer, it's a pneumatic hammer. Pneumothorax is when I got air in the thoracic cavity. Um, so pneumo and pseudo kind of are similar. So pneumo and pseudo, pseudo stratified columnar epithelium is in the respiratory tract. Um, from there, we looked at the two types of stratified. Stratified squamous is the skin. And now, for, and I say the skin, it really, at this point, I do expect you to know it's the epidermis. Right? Um, and then the other one was transitional. Transitional is one that doesn't play well with the naming system, but it is well named. It is a cell that changes shape. It could be flat, it could be cube, it could be column -like. It just depends on what's going on because it lines the urinary bladder. Those all pretty good? Well, connective tissue, there weren't a lot of connective tissues I wanted you to know location-wise. As far as location goes, I do want you to know dense regular connective tissue is the tissue of tendons and ligaments. If you're going into physical therapy or even dealing just in general with nursing stuff, you're going to deal with injuries that are more often involving tendons and ligaments. Dense, regular connective tissue is that tissue. Um, we talked about three types of um, cartilage. We had hyaline cartilage. Remember, hyaline cartilage is the most common type of cartilage. If I have a question about cartilage and you don't know what it is, guess hyaline, right? <laughs> it's all good. Might not get it right, but hey, odds are on your side. Um, we have elastic cartilage, which we found in the ear. Remember, Iron Mike Tyson. I hate that this might be on out on YouTube and somebody sees that. I would hate for him to think that I was saying anything bad about him. But you can kind of remember. I think he'd find a joke in it, I hope. But you can remember about the ear with him. Um, and then the last one was the fibrocartilage, uh, the one that was really blue and red. You know, fibrocartilage is found in the pubic symphysis, and the intervertebral discs. Um, you know, just to, to review again, we got muscles here, the three types of muscles. Remember, in general, there's three types of muscles, skeletal, cardiac, smooth. And we'll talk about them more when we get into the muscular chapter, but those are the three types of muscle. And the main nervous system tissue is the nerve. Chapter 6, the integumentary system, is going to be, again, one of those that's pretty pretty limited. This will be on the low range of questions that I'm going to ask. Um, the integumentary system has three layers, epidermis, dermis, subcutaneous, or hypodermis. Right? Now, remember, and again, bringing up the fact that it can be named subcutaneous, is saying that it is below something called the cutaneous. That's the whole point of it being called subcutaneous. The dermis and the epidermis together make up what we call the cutaneous membrane. That is officially what we refer to as skin. Right? The largest organ of the body is that cutaneous membrane. Um, there are certain things that we looked at. Again, most of the stuff keep with what we looked at in lab for sure too. The hair is one of the more uh, intricate things that we looked at in this chapter, both in here and in lab. Uh, the hair has two parts to it. Uh, anything above the basement membrane, the, the part that divides the epidermis and the dermis is called the hair shaft. Everything below is called the hair root. The hair root is surrounded by a cocoon that we call the hair follicle. At the superficial end of the hair follicle, we're going to have a gland called the sebaceous gland. At the bottom of the hair follicle, we're going to have a smooth muscle called the erector pili muscle. There's been a few mornings um, that I know that I got up and my erector pili muscles when I stepped outside were activated. Earlier this week, there was a cold morning that kind of shocked me a little bit. Um, as far as the epidermis goes, I still want you to know the outer layer of the epidermis is called the stratum cornea. The inner layer is called the stratum basal. Right? Again, just as you know, something to remember, you know, basal is bottom. 
You're going to hear it a couple more times uh, in 211, the word basal. For instance, right off the bat, you're going to study cell, blood cells, uh, white blood cells. The least common white blood cell is called the basophil, and it's called that because it's the least common. On a chart, it's the bottom. And so basal comes up several times uh, next semester for you. Um, Inside the epidermis also there are these cells called melanocytes. They produce melanin. That's what gives you your skin color. And remember, no matter if you've got very dark skin or very light skin, we all have generally the same number of melanocytes. They are just active or uh, different activity levels depending on heredity. Um, our body uses different things to help regulate body temperature. So if we're going through it, if I got cold, uh, the way my body helps raise my blood te temperature up or my body temperature up, if I got cold is, first I'm going to take all the blood and put it into my core. I'm going to try to, to remove as much blood from the surface, and I'm going to cause those erect pili muscles to contract because in any muscle contraction, the majority of energy is released as heat. I'm trying to give you a little warmth. If I get too warm, my body's going to do kind of the opposite. It's going to put my blood right to the surface, and then I'm going to cause my body to sweat. And this liquid that we call sweat, when it evaporates, again, anytime something changes phases, so evaporation is changing from a liquid to a gas, I have to have an energy source. So the energy source for evaporation for our sweat is our, the heat from our blood. So when it changes from a liquid to a gas, it pulls the heat out of our blood to do that. And that's how it cools us down. So that's how our body helps regulate our body temperature using the skin. As far as burns go, it would be very general. Now, again, one of the things that I want to get across more than just having you learn this stuff is to understand how to use it. Again, I think I said this way back at the beginning. You know, my grandmother used to have a saying that um, uh, knowledge is knowing a tomato is a fruit, but wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. When I was a little kid, I didn't understand it. I thought it was cool. Now I get it. I don't care how much you know. If you can't use it, it's worthless, right? you got to start being able to think through processes. So in burns, everybody here knows first, second, and third degree burn. First is the least Damaging, third is the most damaging. But if I list it in the scientific terms, I have students that can't get it. Look, if I gave you three terms that were superficial partial thickness, deep partial thickness, and full thickness, if you can't put those in order, there's a problem in your thought process. Does that make sense? You know, you should be able to figure out superficial is more superficial than deep. And since both of those have the term partial thickness, the other one says full thickness, you should be able to put those in order. I can't tell you how many people I have missed that. You know, don't, you know, be able to step, a, you know, unfortunately, and I get it because I remember being a student, you learn things and I get it and I don't want to get out of my lane. I don't want, you know, I, it's supposed to be like this. You got to be able to take a minute and think through processes. It'll help you in almost, in almost every subject you've got if you can have a logical thought process. Right? So those are the three types of burns. The other thing about burns is we categorize them by percentages of the body. And we said that it was generally a percentage of nine. The arm, front and back, from shoulder to fingers, is considered 9% of my body mass. And so if I have a, a burn that covers my entire arm, it's considered a 9% burn. Now, I'm not going to get into anything that's like, you know, oh, I burned a finger on this hand and, you know, my elbow on the other hand. It would be something that would be like from my elbow down, I burn front and back, which would be half of my arm, and that is 4.5%. It's either going to be whole or half anything I put. Does that make sense? My leg is twice as big as my arm. The legs are considered 18%. And so from hip to my toes, 18%. If it's just front, 9%. If it's just back, 9%. If it's my knee down, 9%. 
that type of stuff. My body is considered 18% thought and 18% thing. My head is considered 9%. Right? And we don't talk about anything else. Because it doesn't fit with the pattern, so we don't want to talk about that. All right. Chapter 7 is the skeletal system. Before we get, I mean, how are, are we all right? We all, okay. Skeletal system. Now, this is not going to be naming bones. This is really, you know, trying to talk about the idea of what the skeletal system is made of. Now, I'm not, I expect you to know certain bones anyway. I'm not saying I'm going to ask them, but there are certain things you need to know that I expect you to have knowledge of now that are fair game. Does that make sense? Um, but as far as the skeleton, you know, the skeletal system goes, remember, uh, first we organize them by shape. There are five types by shape. Long bone, short bone, flat bone, sesamoid, and irregular. Long bones, the classic example is a femur. Short bones are carpals. Flat bones are cranial bones. Um, Sesamoid, we only have one. It's called the patella. And irregular bones, we said were vertebrae. Those would be the examples, if I asked, that I would use. Now, most everything studies the long bone. The long bone is going to have a hard middle shaft called a diaphysis with expanded ends called epiphyses. It is surrounded by a membrane called the periosteum, which means around the bone. Bless you. Now, Inside every bone, there's going to be a mixture of two types of bone, compact and spongy bone. Compact bone, kind of like the long bone, is what we study most. Spongy bone is just bone that looks like a sponge. It doesn't have any real organization. It is little branches that we call trabiculae, which means web-like. The compact bone is going to have repeating structures called osteum. We're not going to get into perforating canals and all of that in here because, again, I've got maybe eight questions to ask from this. I am more interested in you knowing that it is osteons, these little repeating structures called osteons for compact bone, exactly. Now, osteons, again, have layers we call lamella. In between the lamella, we find the mature bone cell called an osteocyte. There are three types of bone cells that you need to know. Osteocytes are mature bone cells. The other two are the ones that build bone or break it down. The cell that builds bone is called an osteoblast. The cell that breaks it down is called an osteoclast. And they live in little lacunae. So anyway, um, when we talk about um, ossification, there's two types of ossification, intermembranous and endochondrial. Now, I am focusing almost entirely on endochondrial, even in our regular lecture. The thing I want you to remember about intermembranous is it makes flat bones. In general, it makes flat bones. In here, again, most of the things would be about the endochondrial. The endochondrial ossification, again, relates mainly to long bones. It is going to have a two-step process. The first area that starts turning to bone is going to be the diaphysis. So it is referred to as the primary ossification site. After it gets a foothold, then I'm going to have the two ends, the two epiphyses, start turning to bone. And so they are called the secondary ossification center. As they turn to bone, there will be a band of hyaline cartilage between the two ossification centers until you reach about the age of 20 to 22. That little band of cartilage is called the epiphyseal plate, your growth plate. Okay? Now, again, in, in the regular lecture, we talked about how bones grow widthwise and how the, uh, the little central canal we call the medullary cavity also expands. But as far as this goes, those questions are way off the grid. But knowing that the epiphyseal plate is the growth plate and allows bones to grow lengthwise is not. And remember, it's hyaline cartilage in between the two. Now, as far as nutrition and stuff goes, you know, we're not going to get into that. But I'm hoping you remember the two big vitamins that we talked about, vitamin D and vitamin C. 
vitamin D is so essential for bone health because we need it to absorb calcium. Calcium is what gives our bone its rigidity, its, its hardness. Again, if you see kids like in third world countries and they got the bow legs that are like, it's because they don't have calcium. They don't, they're vitamin D deficient and so their bones are very rubbery. On the other side, vitamin C is super important for collagen. Collagen is the most important protein fiber that's the building block for your body. I shouldn't say the most important because all of it's important. But not only just your bones, but your skin, your hair, you know, you've got all kinds of things that rely on collagen, and vitamin C is needed for collagen. If you are low on vitamin C, your bones will be very brittle. Right? We call it scurvy. And again, we talked about it here because of pirates and stuff. People have heard of scurvy because pirates had a problem with vitamin C, and we know they were so healthy. But anyway. Um, not going to be a big deal on that. And again, I'm hoping you understand the difference between axial and appendicular portions of the skeleton, right? Axials, the head, neck, you know, the vertebral column, sacrum, rib cage. Uh, appendicular is the uh, arms and legs and the girdles that hold it on. The joints, again, another chapter that's not going to be, you know, that big of one. I'd say the skeletal system's probably mid-range, uh, but the joints... Uh, going to be, yeah. remember we studied three types of joints. We've got fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial. And again, just like how we studied mainly on the long bone, in the joints it's mainly synovial. Synovial joints are the ones we think of. But I still want you to know fibrous, the main fibrous joint I want you to know is sutures. You should know a suture is a fibrous joint. Cartilaginous joints are going to have cartilage between them. One thing I would kind of caution you is remember that the epiphyseal plate, your growth plate, is a type of cartilaginous joint. Right? It is a false cartilage joint, a pseudochondrial joint. It doesn't seem like a joint. It shouldn't move. Dear Lord, I hope none of anybody moves because that's a problem. But it's still a joint because i got bone on one side, bone on the other, and cartilage in between. The other one was a, a symphysis type joint. And we said that if I'm going to give you a location for it, I would use the pubic symphysis, so at least you've got it tied in there. But synovial joints are the main ones, um, and in this, the real thing, again, is going back to like we, we had in the practical. There's two little areas we talked about. One, the six types of joints, ball and socket, hinge, um, uh, chondrial, um, gliding, not hinge, chondrial, gliding, saddle, and plane. Or the gliding is the gliding and, and plane were the same. Um, pivot, pivot joint, atlas axis. So ball and socket was the hip. We had the uh, chondral was the knuckles, the MCP joint, but the knuckles. Uh, the hinge was the elbow. Gliding or plane was the carpals. Pivot joint was the atlas axis, and then finally saddle was the thumb. Right. Um, the other section of it was about the actual movement. So we had flexion extension and along with the little little parentheses of hyperextension. Uh, we talked about abduction and adduction, um, supination, pronation. Uh, we had extension, retraction, um, elevation, depression. You know, those general ideas. Now again, I just listed those. I've got probably six to eight questions maybe that I'm going to ask from this question. This, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going through the, I mean, you know, on the test. Right? So don't, don't spend a ton of time stressing out about it. Think about the general idea of the movement. You're going to be fine. Okay? The muscular system probably gets a little bit more um, on the, the more question side than the average. So, with the muscular system, we start off first with just looking at the muscle. Remember, a muscle cell membrane is not normal, and it has a special name. It is referred to as the sarcolemma. The sarcolemma has this weird ability to transmit an electrical impulse, kind of like an axon. 
So we call it the sarcolimb. It has inside of it the cell mem or the cell uh, muscle fiber. And again, muscle cell, muscle fiber, interchangeable. Inside the muscle fiber, we have these things, these long tubes called myofibrils. Myofibrils are broken up into sections called sarcomeres. This is how a muscle contracts. We are not going to get into the whole idea of all the things going on on how muscles contract, but I do want you to know sarcomeres are the fundamental unit of contraction. Inside the sarcomere, we have two proteins. Again, now I'm not going to get into bands and zones and whatever, but I do expect you to know the Z-lines are the boundaries. So these two little protein filaments inside of it are called actin and myosin. Myosin is the thick filament. Actin is the thin filament. Actin is the one that's attached to the Z-lines. Myosin's in the middle. Again, even though we're not going to go over the whole process of stuff, you still need to know certain things. First, myosin simply has myosin heads. The myosin heads are holding ADP and phosphate. Actin has the majority of other things on it, all the players that go on. So actin has the binding sites. The binding sites are covered by tropomyosin. Again, it is getting between actin and myosin. That's why it has the name myosin in it, tropomyosin. It is held in place covering the binding sites by something called troponin. Once calcium is released, that sets the process to cause the muscle to contract. Tropamin is what binds to calcium. Those are all on actin. Now, inside the muscle fiber again, the muscle cell, the sarcolimma is going to have these extensions called transverse tubules that go into the cell. So when it becomes electrified, I have cords that take it inside the cell. In between those tubules, I have this webbing that surrounds the myofibrils called sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's what holds the calcium. So when it gets electrified, so that's how it starts. Now remember, it is a motor neuron, which we've now studied a couple of times. Motor neurons are going to be what send the signal to the skeletal muscle fiber to have it contract. Now, where the synapse is, now a synapse is anywhere the axon ends, in a skeletal muscle cell, that synapse is called a neuromuscular junction. Remember that every motor neuron in the body that is going to be stimulating a skeletal muscle is using acetylcholine. Okay, this is the first time, again, talking about a neurotransmitter. We'll talk about a couple more when we get into the nervous system. But again, just like if, you, if I have a question about cartilage and you don't know what it is, answer Highland. If I talk about a neurotransmitter and you don't know what it is, guess acetylcholine. Right? Acetylcholine is by far the most common neurotransmitter in the body. Now, when I need to stop the muscle from contracting, my body releases an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. And I constantly try to mispronounce it to give you the clue. It's called acetylcholine erase. It breaks down acetylcholine. Once it removes it from that receptor, it stops the process. So if we're looking at a muscle contraction, it has three parts. A latent part, which is a very short period of time from the time the acetylcholine is released until there's actual movement. Once movement starts, we have a period called the contraction period. Once I release acetylcholine esterase and stop the contraction period, then I go into what's called the relaxation period. Remember, the relaxation period is longer than the contraction period. It takes longer for a muscle to get back to where it was when we started than it did to contract to get to where it is. Does that make sense? So we looked at how if I have a muscle contraction and I stop contracting the muscle, and then before it gets back to normal, I contract it again, I can have a stronger contraction because at that point I've got more myosin heads involved in pulling. We call that summation. That's how we get a stronger contraction. Now, 
if we're looking at a stronger contraction of an entire muscle, then we looked at motor units. Remember, a motor unit by definition is simply one motor neuron and all the skeletal muscle fibers it stimulates. There is no set pattern of how many uh, muscle cells it goes to. It can be only a few or it can be thousands. But the key is it's always one motor neuron. And so every muscle is divided up into motor units. If I need a stronger contraction, I have more motor units involved. If I need just a lighter contraction, fewer motor units. Now, muscles, oh, oxygen, de so when, you know, again, when we're, as you are exercising or doing anything, again, ADP and ATP is the big gasoline that powers our, our engine. And so we have three ways to produce ATP. One is just we have some there for normal everyday stuff. Then we have an enzyme, a, a chemical called creatine phosphate. Our muscles keep for storage for short burst energy. You know, something that's a little bit more than just sitting here taking notes. But if I am going to have any type of prolonged energy, anything that I'm going to do for longer than a few minutes, I have to get into cellular respiration. All right, going into the mitochondria. That's why most muscles are going to have mitochondria in them, a lot of it. And that brings us to our next part of it, which is talking about fast and slow twitch muscle fibers. So if I have this as the midline here, and I say over here are slow twitch fibers and over here are fast twitch fibers. If you can just simply remember fast twitch or sprinters, I need instant energy. I'm not looking for it being long term. Slow twitch fibers are marathon runners. I'm not looking for quick burst energy. I want prolonged energy. That will help you remember everything you need to know about this as long as you have a framework of ideas. First, the mitochondria is where we produce ATP. In order to use the mitochondria, I have to have oxygen. If I have a ton of mitochondria but I don't have oxygen, it is worthless. If I have a ton of oxygen and no mitochondria, it's worthless. It's like, it, you know, when I was growing up in Mississippi, there was someone that had a Porsche, and Porsche 911. I mean, it's in Mississippi. It was in the back row. I mean, if I, want, if I got a Porsche, I want to be in Germany on the Audubon where I can open that thing up or here on 31. But anyway, you know, on dirt roads, it's worthless. You know, so it, you got to have things together. So if I've got slow twitch over here and fast twitch over here, and I'm telling you, this just wants instant energy. It's not looking for long term, so it doesn't need a lot of ATP. It just needs it quick. This isn't going to have a lot of mitochondria. If it doesn't have a lot of mitochondria, it's not going to have a lot of myoglobin, which is holding the oxygen. Over here, if I'm talking about slow twitch and I need a lot of energy, I want a lot of mitochondria. I want a lot of myoglobin. I'm going to have a very intense capillary system on this side because I want long-term energy. Does that make sense? So as long as you get the first part of it down, it should be common sense the way anything else would be phrased in it. Skeletal muscle, there's an intermediate fiber that we, okay, <laughs> there's an intermediate fiber that we don't really study in here, um, and that's mainly us. We're really not one or the other, um, but we can have tendencies to lean one side versus the other, but it's not exaggerated. Again, like in a, um, if you were to have to do an autopsy on Hussein Bolt and then had I can't think of a famous marathon runner, but had somebody who was a marathon runner professionally. Um, who? That guy. Zola, Zola Bud. Okay. I have to remember that. No, I love that. So Zola Bud, and I love, and they, everybody has such cool names. Zola Bud. 
Okay. So if you had the, an autopsy of mine, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. But if I have a chicken, it's very exaggerated between white and dark meat. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so, but, so and, but whatever you are, you can't really change from one to the other. You know, if, I, if Hussein Bolt wanted to train to be a marathon runner, he's not really going to have, he's not going to change his makeup. Does that make sense? Bad man. Uh, <laughs> he's he actually listen to some of his interviews. He's a really cool guy. Does he? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. yeah. But it's good though. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I hear you. The um, so um, uh, skeletal, smooth, and cardiac. There were so many things I wanted to say because you see, he made tracks, but he should have stayed on a track. He did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, get. I'm sorry. You said. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so. Um, skeletal, smooth, and cardiac muscle, all right? Remember, skeletal muscle is pretty much the only thing in our body we have voluntary control over. Everything else is involuntary. That's why cardiac and smooth are involuntary as well. Um, skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle are striated. In cardiac muscle, there is going to be these little definitive stripes that we call intercalated discs. All they are is where the, the muscle cells come together because they have to pull on each other. Um, they, they have a thickened bond between them. Um, as far as origin and insertion goes, you know, it's, I would just want you to know origin is the fixated part of a, the stable part of the muscle. The insertion is the movable part. So the rest of it is getting into the nervous system, 10, 11, and 12. Chapter 10 is pretty much focused on the neuron. Okay. So when we're looking at this, the neuron is going to be the star. So um, remember, the neuron is going to have dendrites and an axon in general. Dendrites bring information in. The axon takes it away. The axon, there's always only one axon that leaves the cell. Remember that the area where the axon leaves the cell is referred to as the axonal hillock. And that's a big changing point between the cell body and the dendrites and the axon. Now, there are three types of, um, three types of neurons. You're going to have what's called unipolar, bipolar, multipolar. Unipolar means there's only one extension. Bipolar means there's two. Multipolar means there's many. Multipolar is by far the most common type of neuron in the body. 99% of all the neurons in your body are going to be multipolar neurons. The other two are two types of sensory neurons. Unipolar neurons are your general senses. All the things coming in from your peripheral nervous system, from your body and your hands and your feet or whatever, they are unipolar neurons. Bipolar neurons are special senses. They are your, your rods and cones. They're going to be your taste buds. They're going to be the things inside your ear to help for hearing. Bipolar neurons are special, special senses. Now, I'm not really worried about the neural glial cells, I'll tell you. Um, so when we look at the cells called neural glial cells, which are helper cells, there's going to be five that are in the central nervous system and only two in the peripheral nervous system. But by far, the two biggest ones are the ones that provide myelin. In the peripheral nervous system, it's the swan cell. We looked at that's the one we generally study. Remember, though, that in the central nervous system, it's called an oligodendrocyte. Oligodendrocyte, good time, fun word to say. 
Now, wherever they wrap around the axon, they're going to leave little gaps between the areas. We call those gaps nodes of Ranvier. Now, the other ones, of the other ones, I'll tell you the one to know for sure uh, because it's a it's because it leads into uh, cerebral spinal fluid is epidemial cells. Epidemial cells in the central nervous system line ventricles and they have cilia on them that cause the, the cerebral spinal fluid to circulate. All right. Now the other ones are obviously really important in in the real world. Astrocytes are probably one of the things that are being studied the most right now because it turned out that they're they're big in uh, different types of cancer and different types of problems inside the central nervous system. Uh, you have your microglial cells, which are phagocytic cells. But again, as far as this test goes, because I don't have a ton of questions I can ask, and there is so much on these chapters, if I'm going to ask about neuroglial cells, the first thing I'm going to ask is either is about a swan or oligodendrocell. If I'm going to ask anything else, I'm sorry? Yeah. Um, and the other one is because we do talk about cerebral spinal fluid, it would be the epidemial cells would lend to that. Um, so the next part is getting into the, the craziness of resting membrane potential. All right. So um, neurons have a charged membrane. We call it a resting membrane potential. You need to know that it is negative 70. You also need to know that in order for the axon to be engaged and send a signal, the resting membrane potential needs to be depolarized to negative 55. Now, some terms that are good to know. First, since we're talking about it being at negative 70, that means it's already polarized. Right? Once I get away from zero, it's polarized. If I take negative 70 and make it less negative, that is referred to as depolarization. If, on the other hand, I start at negative 70 and I push it farther negative, that's called hyperpolarization. So negative 70, which we're going to kind of say is normal, polarized. If I make it closer to zero, that's depolarization. Farther away is hyperpolarization. So when we talked about that axonal hillock, things on the cell body side of it, the influences that are coming into the cell can have either depolarization or hyperpolarization properties. Things on the from the axonal hillock towards the cell body and the dendrite can be in all waves and all sizes and shapes. I couldn't speak there for a second, sorry. So I can have things that are going to make it closer to negative 55 and things that are going to push it away from negative 55. Things that depolarize or make it closer to negative 55 are referred to as stimulatory. Things that push it away or hyperpolarize it are called inhibitory. All of those coming in gather up at the axonal hillock, and we refer to that as summation. They have to all be gathered together and make a, a depolarization of 15 millivolts, get it to negative 55 in order to send a signal. But negative 55 is the starting point. So... All of these are coming in. They've got all the different charges, some are positive, some are negative, they go and summate at the axonal hillock. If it gets up to negative 55, it starts. And it starts because all of the, so, or all of the, the ion channels, sodium and potassium, along the cell membrane from that point on are voltage gated. Now, remember, potassium is on the inside of the cell. Sodium is on the outside of the cell. And this is the way it is as it, it needs at normal and it needs to send this way. Now, the other thing to remember is as this, what we're going to call an action potential, because that's what it's named on the axon, when this action potential gets to the synapse, when it gets to the synaptic bulb, it is no longer sodium that comes in, it is calcium. 
That is why calcium, having blood calcium levels at a certain level are huge because all neural transmissions need calcium. So at the axonal hillock, I hit negative 55. At that point, water, sodium rushes in. It opens up, sodium's on the outside, and it rushes in. It would literally be like the equivalent of if, if outside that wall is just water, keep it at that, and this door could open in, and I went and I opened it and water just came in. Sodium just floods in. And since sodium is a positive ion, just like potassium is, when it comes in, I have a really quick depolarization. So I become positive. It gets to a positive 30, and at positive 30, potassium channels open. Now, since I have a ton of sodium in here with the potassium, and they're both positive ions, it is like having a whole bunch of magnets of one charge put into a small container. As soon as that potassium door opens, potassium rushes out. Now, I've got positive leaving, so that means I'm going to have a quick depol or repolarization of it getting back to where it was. That little wave is called an action potential. That's what moves down the axon. Now, once that wave hits that synaptic knob or synaptic bulb, it is calcium that comes in. Calcium is what determines what neurotransmitter gets released. So far, so good. More will come faster. More will come faster. Again, it's not going to be anything, you know, it's, there will be one question maybe or two on this for the rest of the year. Now, again, um, that next one that starred is simply talking about how um, the resting membrane potential, again, can be changed if it's either excitatory or inhibitory. All right. Chapter 11. Again, chapter 11 is a huge, huge chapter. Now, this is going to break down the nervous system in the central and peripheral nervous system. Remember, the nervous system is central, brain spinal cord, and peripheral, nerves that come off of it. Bless you. The central nervous system is surrounded by membranes we call meninges. There are three meninges in order from the one that's the outermost. It's called dura matter, arachnoid matter, pia matter, DAP, DAP. Um, there is a space underneath the arachnoid matter called the subarachnoid space, where you're going to find cerebral spinal fluid. And again, if there's anything about cerebral spinal fluid, these are the two big things, well, three, where it's found, subarachnoid space. And the word subarachnoid, you should be able to figure out it means it's below whatever the heck arachnoid is. The other thing is the things that produce it, there's a specialized group of capillary beds called the choroid plexus. They are what produce cerebral spinal fluid. And the third is the epidemial cells. The epidemial cells are the things that make it circulate. Now, the parts of the the brain, so the, again, central nervous system is brain and spinal cord, the four parts of the brain. And we said this, you know, in lab when we're looking at it, and we even talked about it here. The four parts are simply cerebrum, cerebellum, diencephalon, brainstem, however you want to organize that. Right? The cerebrum, the big gray wrinkly part, has that layer of gray matter on the outside that we call the cerebral cortex. We said 75% of all of the neuron cell bodies in your body are found in that thin gray layer. The cerebrum has four, it's five lobes, but we look at four, frontal, parietal, temporal, occipital. We're not going to get into all the major things about association areas and all that craziness, but I would remember frontal lobe is about problem solving. It is about complex pattern memorization. It is personality, conscience. And it is the only motor part. The difference between the parietal and temporal, which there's, they kind of seem like they overlap, but the temporal is far more complex. The temporal is more about memories and patterns of things like music and, you know, art. 
So if you're someone that can you know, hear a song and remember the words really quickly, it is because your temporal lobe does a good job of storing them. The parietal is about hearing and stuff, but it's not the same. Does that make sense? Occipital, it's all about vision. Occipital lobe, the main claim to fame is it's about the vision. The brain stem, remember your brain stem, you've got the, the uh, midbrain is the topmost part. The pons is this little, uh, this little belly that sticks out. As I'm looking at that, I can say that pons. And then the very bottommost part is the medulla oblongata, right? The medulla oblongata. Uh, the cerebellum. There's not a lot that I can go into about the cerebellum. We didn't talk about it much except for the fact that it is what is coordinating your sensory and motor impulses to make sure they're matching up. Again, we talked about how if you've ever seen somebody that's drunk at a bar and they're trying to grab their beer or whatever and they can't quite grab it, it's because their cerebellum isn't matching up what they're seeing with what they're trying to do. Right? The other part is uh, the diencephalon. So the diencephalon has a couple of parts to it. The two main parts are the thalamus and the hypothalamus. And I'm going to talk about the hypothalamus first. The hypothalamus is the crossover between the nervous system and the endocrine system. It controls this gland called the pituitary gland, which is the master gland of the body. So there's two big areas of homeostatic reflexes uh, for your body. One is the medulla oblongata that is all nervous system. The other one is the hypothalamus, which is nervous system and endocrine. Now, the thalamus has a counterpart called the basal nuclei, which isn't part of the diencephalon. But I want you to remember them kind of as a pair because they are like the yin and the yang. They're, they're, they're opposite, but they do similar things. First, the thalamus is all about organizing sensory input. So imagine that this was a really big campus building with lots and lot one building with lots of classrooms. And when you walked in, um, let's say that we had our uh, public safety officer sitting at the desk and you would go in and say, all right, I need you know, Dr. Fandel's uh, two, 210 classroom, whatever. And they would po point you where to go. That's what the thalamus does. When we have sensory input coming into the brain, it sorts it and sends it to the areas of the brain it needs to go. Its counterpart, which is working on motor impulses, is the basal nuclei. So when I send a signal out from my brain to areas of my body, it goes through this area and it smooths it out. I, you know, it's hard to ex explain, but um, back in the day, in the in the wayback machine, when um, radios had actual dials, and you had to try to get in, you know, dial it in on a station. If you didn't have it exactly right, there was a lot of static. On it. Anybody remember that? There was a point in time where they came up with this great invention called FM mute, which just basically said. I'm just going to weed out the static. You might not hear much, but at least you won't hear the static at least. The basal nuclei is kind of like being the FMU. It's taking all of the stuff coming out and organizing it to make sure it's all smooth. Does that make sense? Basal nuclei, motor impulses, thalamus, sensory impulses. Hemisphere dominance, again, general information. Uh, overall, the average is that most people are left brain dominant. Um, that is not, you know, just standard, but that's that's by far the most common way it's set up. Remember, the left brain is more uh, mathematics and science and more just straight rational thought. The right side is more artistic. It is more basically emotional. Um, and that's just, again, general information. But this is that's not a big part of it, so don't worry. Um, ascending and descending spinal tracts. This should be easy. Again, 
all ascending tracks are sensory. Since the brain is the great decider of things, all questions are going up. Ascending is sensory. Descending is motor. It's saying my brain has made a decision on something and it's sending it out. Ascending is sensory. Descending is motor. Of the tracks, most, and the ones that I would present to you, are going to have the word spine or spinal somewhere in there. If it's at the beginning, that means it's going into the spine and up to the brain. That means all things that start with spine are ascending and therefore sensory. The other group are going to end with spine. That means it's going from the brain down to the spine and out. So it is descending, therefore they are all motor. So if it ends with spine, the word, that means that it is a descending and therefore a motor track. Reflex arc, I don't see it on here, but remember, there are five parts to a basic reflex arc. A receptor, a sensory neuron, which could be called an afferent neuron, an interneuron, which is the only part of it that is central nervous system, and then a motor neuron. The motor neuron will then go to either a muscle or a gland, and they are called effectors. So the five parts are Receptor, sensory neuron, interneuron, motor neuron, effector. There were two types of reflexes we looked at. They both involved trying to stabilize the body as we stepped on something sharp. If I step on something sharp and I'm pulling my foot away, it is called a withdrawal reflex. Now, it's not just that. If I'm touching something, I can pull my hand away. Uh, but we just use it because there's more to it than just pulling the foot away. So a withdrawal reflex is I'm pulling a body part away from uh, something that is damaging or painful. Um, if it is talking about my leg, then I'm going to have another part of that reflex called the crossed extensor reflex, which just means the opposite side, crossed over, is going to extend so I don't fall down. Right, but those are the basic reflexes. Um, peripheral nerves, you know, I just, I'm not worried about too much with that. Um, but understand that outside of the cranial nerves, all peripheral nerves are going to be, um, are going to have both motor and sensory components to them, or mixed nerves. Um, As far as cranial nerves goes, look, the only ones that I want you to know for here for sure are going to be the two that are associated with the things from the special senses that are the models we looked at. Cranial nerve 2, which is optic. Cranial nerve 8, which is vestibulocochlear. They are both sensory-only nerves. The other one I do think you should know is the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve ties us into what the bottom part of this where I have two stars on it. If there is anything on here that's going to come up multiple times outside of pH and osmosis and chemistry stuff, it is going to be sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system stuff. So the peripheral nervous system has two divisions. The divisions are the autonomic nervous system and the somatic nervous system. The somatic nervous system is voluntarily controlled part. Whether it's motor or sensory, if I can feel it, that's somatic. If I can move it, it's somatic. The autonomic is the automatic pilot. It is what's controlling everything underneath my conscious effort. And it is divided into two other categories, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Now remember, parasympathetic is normal. It is referred to as rest and digest because in the parasympathetic nervous system, under normal conditions, the only thing it's stimulatory for or trying to keep going is your digestive tract. Under normal conditions, your body's sole purpose is to digest what I've just given it and figure out what I need to do with it. Do I store it? Do I use it to build stuff? Or do I need to just get it out of my body? Parasympathetic is normal. Sympathetic is called fight or flight. That's when I become stressful or need energy. 
At that point, it shuts down the digestive tract and releases the glucose. Now, parasympathetic is called parasympathetic because it is a round sympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic nervous system comes out of the spine in the thoracic area mainly. The parasympathetic is the, is the brain stem and sacrum. That is why it's called parasympathetic because it surrounds it. Now, the main part of the parasympathetic nervous system is cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve. Now, with these two, there are two neurons. It's a relay race from the spinal cord to the target organ. And so I have this setup where I've got two neurons between me and, let's say, that door. We'll say the door is the heart. In the parasympathetic nervous system, the preganglionic neuron, the one that's the first, is really, really long. I go all the way pretty much to that door. I drop my information off on that second neuron, and it's only like an inch. Close to the heart. In the parasympathetic nervous system, every one of the things in it are about acetylcholine. In the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight, it is different. I need to get my signal out quick and spread it to everything. In the sympathetic nervous system, if I'm, try if I'm scared and I'm trying to get my heart to start beating faster, I'm not only worried about my heart, but I'm worried about my digestive tract. I'm worried about my lungs. I'm worried about everything else. So I need to come right out of the gate, synapse right here to spread it to everything. So in the sympathetic nervous system, I have a short preganglionic fiber. The postganglionic fiber is long. Now, in the sympathetic nervous system, there is a unique, some would argue, neurotransmitter, or finally one that's different than acetylcholine. Our textbook calls it norepinephrine. I'm going to call it adrenaline. I can go to a grade school, and if I ask about what adrenaline does, kids know it gives you energy, and it's usually involved in times of stress. I'm scared. I got an adrenaline rush. So if I'm saying that I've got four neurons here, the two from the parasympathetic, two from the sympathetic, you should be able to figure out that if one of them is releasing adrenaline, or epinephrine, it's going to be on the sympathetic side. Now the big question is, is it the pre- or post-ganglionic fiber? And again, common sense. If I have the heart here, and I have one come in here and one come in here, if this side is releasing acetylcholine and it causes my heart rate to decrease or remain normal, if I want this to increase it, I'm not going to release another bunch of acetylcholine on it. If I want the heart to do something different, I need to have something different here. Just a logical thought process should eliminate all the other options and say, hey, the part that's going to release adrenaline, norepinephrine, is the postganglionic fiber in the, synap in the uh, sympathetic nervous system. By just thought process. Now, anything that releases acetylcholine, the neurons that release acetylcholine, or even the receptors that bind to acetylcholine are called cholinergenic neurons or receptors. If it releases adrenaline, norepinephrine, or binds to adrenaline, norepinephrine, it is called adrenergenic neuron or receptor. Now, remember, so, you know, you start off the gate in 211, you're going to be studying the cardiovascular system. There's going to be a whole section on what part of the nervous system causes my heart rate to increase, what part of it causes it to decrease. How does it work? It's going to go back to this stuff. The respiratory system is going to go back to this stuff. The digestive system is going to go back to this stuff. Chapter 12, 
Now, we did not get to cover it in here. We're still using the same framework that we use for the lab. The two big parts of it are the eye and the ear. But before we got to that, we looked at things like receptors. There are five types of receptors. We had chemoreceptors, which monitor chemical changes. We had thermal receptors, which monitor temperature changes. We have mechanoreceptors, which monitor mechanical changes, stress and pressure. And then we had photoreceptors, which monitor light changes. And then the last one was nociceptors, which were pain fibers, which were kind of like modified chemoreceptors. Now, the eye and the ear. The eye obviously uses photoreceptors. The two types of photoreceptors are rods and cones. Rods are for low light image. They don't need a lot of light to send their, their signal in. Uh, the image that they create is going to be black and white and kind of fuzzy. Cones, on the other hand, while they need more light to send their signal to be triggered, it will produce a colored image that is going to be very sharp. And so those are the two types of photoreceptors. In the ear, the area of the ear for hearing is the cochlea. Inside the cochlea, I have mechanoreceptors that are going to be there because they're taking pressure waves. Even the semicircular canals, which are for our balance, they have mechanoreceptors in it because they're monitoring changes in movement. These receptors outside of pain can go through what we call sensory adaptation, which just means I become adapted to my surroundings. Now, in our body, we have a kind of a map in our brain of areas of our body so that if something happens and I can't see it, I can still know where it's coming from. If someone touches me on my back, I have an idea that someone touched me on my back. I don't feel like it came from my foot. Right? So I have this kind of framework in my brain, and we call those dermatones. Dermatones are little areas that have specific nerves that are coming in. If you've ever seen someone that has shingles, you see a dermatone level because a shingle is going to is a, a virus that's going to be on a distinct neuron, and it's on a distinct dermatone level. Um, the other thing with these is that um, our body doesn't allow us to really feel what our organs are feeling. And so we have no conscious awareness of what our heart's going through or what's going on in our stomach necessarily. And so if something goes wrong with those viscera, those little organs, they hijack sensory receptors from other areas. And most of us know this simply by the idea of one of the first signs of a heart attack outside of chest pain is going to be left arm pain. If all of a sudden you feel like there's this pain in your chest and then you start feeling left arm pain, you call 911 right away because this is telling you it's not just my arm. Something's going on with my heart. My arm has nothing to do with my heart except for the fact that the sensory neuron that's coming from my arm going into my brain happens to pass close to the, the what we call um, special senses, the uh, I'm drawing a blank, visceral, visceral sensory neuron from my heart, and it kind of says, hey, tell, my, tell your brain that I'm having a problem. And so my brain feels like it's coming from here just because it doesn't have a direct connection, right? So we call that referred pain. Now, as far as the other two, you know, the, um, the eye and the ear, you know, going over it, you know, the oracle is the outer part of the ear. It is made up of elastic cartilage. Um, the, uh, the opening, the external acoustic or external uh, auditory acoustic meatus, um, those I wouldn't expect to be much of a question, but the scientific name for the eardrum is a pretty important one. Right? The tympanic membrane is the scientific name for the eardrum. Remember that on the other side of that, we have these three bones called ossicles. They are the malus, the incus, and the stapes in order from the outermost to the innermost. Malus, incus, stapes. We're not going to have a picture, so there's nothing that you can label, but I might have those jumbled up in a couple different things and ask you which one's the right order. Right? 
the area where the hearing mechanism is is called the cochlea. And remember, those receptors are mechanoreceptors. The area um, for balance and equilibrium is the semicircular canals. And that's basically it. I mean, the eustachian, the, um, um, the eustachian tube is, or the auditory tube is the area that connects the inner part of the ear with your pharynx, your throat. Again, that's not a question that I'm expecting to ask because we don't go over a lot of the things that I'd need you to know to you know, talk about. The eye, concentrate on the big idea parts, right? Um, and I guess it all kind of is. But, you know, you've got the outer layer called the sclera. It's an easy question to say, what is the outer white layer of the eye called? Think about, I'm lazy. I'm going to ask questions that I'm going to be able to just write pretty quickly. Right? Honestly, all joking aside, if you, when you're studying, think about if I was a professor, what questions I would ask. Because you'll see obvious questions that are going to be there. You know, if you study like that and you're looking at it, you'll see, all right, that's an easy one. So the outer part is the sclera. Uh, the outer clear part of the sclera is called the cornea. And again, by far, cornea is, a, is more important than the sclera as far as what you're going to deal with just in life. If you say, I don't even want to deal with any more A&P classes or whatever, you'll probably hear about cornea problems. I mean, all of us will probably at one day, especially since we live at the beach, we'll probably deal with um, cataracts um, because, of, because of cornea issues. Right? So behind the cornea, I've got a round muscle called the iris. Iris has an opening in the middle called the pupil. Those are pretty important things. The pupil, as it you know, changes the shape of the, or the, the iris, as it changes the shape of that pupil, allows more or less light to come in. Directly behind that, we have the lens. The lens is what is going to focus the light. Now, we in, in lab, we looked at the ciliary body and the, um, the suspensatory ligaments that help change the shape of the lens. Now, if I've got, you know, I'm not going to have many questions on this chapter. This chapter will again be kind of on a lower one since we didn't spend a lot of time on it. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time on some of those questions. You know, I, if I've only got a couple of questions to ask about the eye, I'm definitely going to worry more about the iris, knowing that you know the name of the smooth muscle called the iris more than the ciliary body. I want you to know that the, the nervous tissue on the inside is called the retina. Retina is what's lined with rods and cones. It is optic nerve, cranial nerve number two, which is sensory only. So that, you know, those would be kind of the big, big parts of it. Now, does that all make sense? How do you feel? I mean, look, 